John chapter 1, verse 16. Church, can we read together? And of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. One more time. And of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. Matthew 9, verse 37. Let's read together, church. One to go. Then said he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. So, while I was going to speak here, I asked Pastor Nee to give me some tips as a more experienced um, fellow. And so, we will go from the known to the seemingly unknown. So, now, when we receive Jesus, we receive the life of God. When you receive Jesus, you receive the life of God. And life as we know it is a combination of systems. So in the natural, in my biology, I remember that there are seven characteristics of life. There is nutrition, there's respiration, there's excretion, there's growth, there's movement, there's sensitivity, there's reproduction. That is at the basic level. If you go to master's and PhD, they'll start telling you about cells and other systems within those systems. Hallelujah. That is why John 7, 38, he says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow river of living waters. This, when he said waters, he was talking about the spirit of God. Waters, it speaks to something that is diverse, a compound thing that consists of many other things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I've said all of that to say this, that when you receive life, you have received an embodiment of numerous things. In that one life that you have received, there's a lot of things inside that life. Hallelujah. Media, show me 1 Corinthians 12, just to confirm this. I want us to establish that fact in our heart, that when you receive life, that life consists of numerous things. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 to 6. 1 Corinthians 12. Now, let's read together. Now, there are diversities of gifts but the same spirit. Verse 5. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. Verse 6. And there are diversities of oppression, but it is the same God, which worketh all in all. So we see that by that one spirit that you have received, there are diversities of oppressions, of administrations, and of gifts. As you are, as you are now sitting, I don't know what your weight is, or body mass index, 55 kg, 20, 15 kg, 35 kg. There is a whole lot going inside of you. As you move, there are things going on on the inside of you. That life is an embodiment of numerous things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when we received Christ, we were drawn into a self-sufficient system of life. We were drawn out of, Colossians says we were brought out of darkness. Out of a system of darkness. We were brought into a self-sufficient system of life. Hallelujah. So, the main point I'm getting at is this. People see grace as one of those things that God has given. But I'm here to tell you that everything is grace. Everything combined together is grace. Life, breath, the anointing, gifts, talent, ability, health. Everything that we have received, we can put it under one umbrella. What did I call it? What did I call it? Hallelujah. So now, when I went to look at the dictionary, the Greek, the Hebrew, grace seems to be a, a word that is so diverse and broad. There are many definitions and many uses. And in, in interpreting scripture, a word can mean two things. A good example I heard someone give is when you say, when your boss tells you, get me a cup of tea. And you bring it and say, sir, that is your cup of tea. You know you are fine. Now, in the same boardroom, if there's a challenge and you respond, that is your cup of tea. You will get fired. So a word can mean two different things in scripture. It's one of the rules of interpreting scriptures. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world. First John says, love not the world. So we see it is word, it is word. Are, we, are they trying to play us? No. It means that in the original text, the word is referring to different things. When it says love not the world, it's talking about the systems of the world. When it says God loves, so loved the world, it's talking about the humans in the world. And so whenever we read a verse of scripture, it can mean something here and mean something else. 
And this is because the English language is not sufficient enough to capture what has been put and, and communicated through the ancient languages. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is somebody being blessed this morning? I know you are being blessed even if you don't say it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so the, the best definition I found for grace is this. It is a divine influence which operates in humans to regenerate, sanctify, inspire virtuous impulses, to impart strength, endure trial, and resist temptation. Now, that is quite broad. This is the one I love. Divine influence upon the heart and reflection in the life of a being. Grace is a divine influence on the heart and a reflection. So when something comes from above, from God, upon you, and then it can flow out, that is grace. And our, you know, our text, John 1, 16 says, of his fullness we have received. Church, of his fullness we have received what? Grace upon grace. So I want to disabuse your mind if you think that some people have grace and you don't. Everybody sitting here, you have received grace. Everybody sitting here looking at me in the gallery down here, you have received grace. Somebody say, I have grace. I don't know what you have heard before, what they told you before. But you know if you do that kind of thing. You know if you do them. I have grace. And the Bible says that in Titus, that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That is grace personified. Again, we see, the Bible says we should come boldly to the throne of grace. Grace is a person. Grace is a person. Grace is a person. And so, because you have received the life of God, you have received God, you have therefore received what? You have therefore received what? Somebody say, I have received grace. The next time you go through a challenge or you face a roadblock and everything is telling you you can't make it, you can't push through, just shout, I have received grace. Hallelujah. Stay with me. So now that I've established that you have received grace, Let's look at Acts 4.33. To just further confirm it. Because the Bible says that all scripture is given for reproof. The meaning of reproof is proof, evidence. So when you are sick and you say, I am healed. And something tells you, who told you you are healed? You say, well, the word of God says so. The evidence of your healing is not what you feel in your body. The evidence of healing, the proof of healing is what the word of God has said. So if the word of God has said it, that is all the proof that you ever need. Your leg might still be paining you. But if the word of God says you are healed, sir, you are healed. Because we don't walk by what we feel. We walk by what the word of God has said. All scripture is given for reproof. So if the spirit says, prove it that you are feeling fine. Maybe your head is paining you. Prove it. Just open the scripture. By his stripes, I am healed. That's the proof. And so we speak into that healing. Hallelujah. Acts 4.33. So I just want to give us scriptures to just further show you that you have received grace. Let's read together. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord and great grace was upon them. You have great grace. Romans 1 verse 5. Romans 1 verse 5, quickly. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. You have received grace. Romans 12 verse 3. So it's important that we confirm these things with scriptures. So you see, I didn't say it, scripture said it. Again, for I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Let's do one more. First Corinthians 1 verse 4. I thank my God always, on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. If you will leave this hall with anything, live with this one thing. You have grace. You have grace. Hallelujah. So now that we have established this fact that you have grace, there's a popular saying that when the purpose of a thing is unknown, abuse is inevitable. And now when we talk about abuse, what comes to our mind most of the time is wrong usage, misappropriation. But let me shock you. In the faith, unuse is also abuse. 
Because grace is a trust. God trusted himself. He trusted you with himself. So it's, it's like you go to GT Bank and they give you a loan of 150 million with the promise that you will do something with it. And then you just, you feel like your mood just changed. You're not doing it again. Then you kept the money. And then you're coming back five years later to say, I didn't feel like doing. Take. What have you done? You have abused grace. You have abused grace. So I will show you a scripture that speaks to misappropriation of grace. Then I will show you the one that speaks to not using grace, being an abuse also. Please go with me. Let's go to Jude chapter 1 verse 4. Jude 1 verse 4. Let's read together. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You can see that this scripture is not really speaking to believers. He says ungodly men. Can you please leave the scripture on the screen? Thank you. He says ungodly men. So when we think about people abusing grace, it's not very common among believers. It's not very, very common. What is most common is not using grace. It's a snare. It's a trap. Most times we feel like as if we have received it and we are fine. We want to enjoy it. Sir, ma, the grace of God is a trust. Beyond enjoyment, it is a trust. It is actually an investment. Hallelujah. Let's go to the next, the next verse of scripture. Okay. Um, okay. So, we remember the story of the, of the talent. Very good story. The king gave one. He gave five. He gave two. He gave one. That's grace. The one with five went to multiply. The one with two went to work with it. Listen, they did not enjoy it. See, when we have the mindset of enjoying grace, that is eating seed. That is eating seed. Grace is an investment for action. So the one with one, he felt the king was, you know, I don't know, I don't know how you got your grace that you gave me. He just gave me, then he went to bury it. Do you know what the king called him? Wicked servant. If you were to judge, you would say, Shebi, he returned it back now, the same way you gave him. No, the king called him wicked. It is wickedness to have received grace from God and not use it. It is outright wickedness. Why? Because you need to think about what it cost God to give you that grace. It cost him the life of his son. So when you have received the grace and you don't make use of it, from that parable, we see God terms it as wickedness. And we must, not, and we must be careful not to take the grace and the mercy of God for granted. Because God is not the taskmaster, because he won't knock you on the head. Hallelujah. Let's move further. John 15 verse 2. Let's look at John 15 verse 2. John chapter 15 verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Look at the last part. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. In the parable of the talent, the king says something. He said, he who has, more will be given to him. Now, the, when he says he who has, he's not talking about the seed. He's talking about the harvest. They were given the baseline of five, two, and one. He who has, more will be given. Many times we pray for more grace, more grace. But the one that they gave you, have you used it? Because how to receive grace is when you walk with the grace that you have been given already. So that's why he says in that passage that it is the tree that bears fruit that he will purge so that it can bear more. So if you see that you are stagnant, if you see that you are not being very, very productive, you need to ask, have you used what is in your hands yet? Hallelujah. Grace, again, is a trust. 
not a title. It's not a decoration. It's a loan. See, think about grace like this. It's a loan. It's an investment. Invest, investment is not for enjoyment, at least not in the now. We walk with, with an investment. And then when it yields the produce, then you are glad. Hallelujah. Now, I want to give us a, a formula that I saw. Before I go there, so it brings this question. So, now that we have seen the purpose of grace, how do you maximize grace? We've talked about grace being abused, and I want this to stay, this to stay in your heart. If you don't use grace, you're abusing grace. Maybe you are here, you have the gift of a teacher. What they are chasing you about in your cell unit to come. You are, you, you are, you are trying to escape. I'm, I'm shy. I'm this. I'm... Jesus Christ was not shy when he died for you. And this thing has a cost. It has a price. It's an investment. I don't like to be in the front. I don't like to hold microphone. Fine. Don't worry. But in your office, in that place where you have influence, are you making use of that grace? Reverend said on Itak, break the alabaster box. Let the aroma, let it flow out. The Bible said that we are the fragrance of God. Made known in every place. They are supposed to run side by side. So what we see happen is that people are faithful. They keep coming and they keep coming and they keep coming. But they are not effective. Effectiveness will show in maturity. Effectiveness will show in increase. So when we gather together in, in a place, the Bible says, I heard, I heard someone say this, that God has called us to be fishers of men and not to be an aquarium. So that means that with the grace God has given unto us, we need to be increased conscious. They've given me this investment. It will expire very soon. I need to let it out. I need to plant it. I need to work with it. Somebody needs to feel it. Somebody needs to touch it. That is the, the, that, that's the type of urgency with which we should work the grace given unto us. Hallelujah. So this, this is the formula. How do you maximize grace? It's by labor. People have always thought labor to be the opposite of grace. And it's that enjoyment mentality. Labor is not the opposite of grace. Hallelujah. So I'll give you this formula and I'll prove that to you also. Hallelujah. All right, so grace plus labor is equal to fruitful Christian living. Grace plus labor is equal to fruitful Christian living. Now, grace minus labor is equal to failure. You know, the people that think that grace is enjoyment, when you have exams, why don't you just close your books and say you have grace and go into the exam hall like that? Why do you read even though you have grace. It's because there's a labor that is needed for grace to become impactful. So, grace minus labor is equal to what? Failure. Now, the third equation, labor minus grace is equal to frustration. I didn't write it. I saw it somewhere and it was, it was just so good. I had to share it. Labor, so when we labor without the grace, we'll be frustrated. That's what the Bible says, except the Lord builds the house. Those that build, they build in vain. So, you know, you ask this question, except the Lord builds the house. Those that build, they build in vain. So, two people are building. The Lord is building. They too, they are building. Why don't they say, since the Lord is building, let us not build again? I, 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 is, is somebody seeing this? Except the Lord, he says, except the Lord builds the house. They build us. They build in vain. So as the builders are building, the Lord too is building. Hallelujah. So, I'm taking you somewhere and what I want you to see is God is a laborer. God himself is a laborer. Let us go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. This is Apostle Paul. Let's read together. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. That's it. 
The builder builds in vain if God doesn't build. So Paul had grace and he said he labored more. Do you know Paul singularly wrote 13 books out of the 27 in, in, in the New Testament? Just one man out of 12 apostles. He wrote half of the New Testament. He planted more churches. That's grace and what? Grace and what? And labor. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8 to 10. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8 to 10. Let's read together. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Next verse. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted. Please stay there. Please go back. Let's read it again. Wherefore we labor that whether we or absent, we may be what? We may be what? Are we seeing the marking scheme now? This is the marking scheme. Next verse. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. If I remember clearly the scripture, it says that our work will be tested by fire. I want you to think about it. Everything you have been doing, can it stand the test of fire? Houses will not stand the test of fire. Cars will not. Degrees will not. Connects will not. CBN will not. So there is a type of work that is eternal in dimension. There's a type of labor that has weight in heaven. You know, when we look at the exchange rate of Naira to dollar, I don't know what it is now, 5.75. So for one dollar there, it's 5.75 here. So there's an exchange rate. So if you look at heaven's exchange rate, so you use the exchange rate to tell the value of your currency, of what you have. So, so, so for example, if you have 400 Naira, it means you don't have up to a dollar. If you have 200 Naira, you don't have up to a dollar. So the same thing, convert what you have worked, what you have done now, and look at the exchange rate of heaven. What is the value? What is the eternal value of what you have done so far for the last 30 years, 40, 50, 60, 70 years? What is the eternal value? Hallelujah. And this is something that we should all think about. Hallelujah. So grace is not a license for laziness. Because you have grace, that is why you must work hard. If you don't have grace, you might not worry. You know, whatever will be, will be. Like some people will say, I don't believe that. But, but because you have grace, that is why you should even work hard. In your office. On that project. In church. In your work with God. Because you have grace. Grace is the reason why we work hard. Hallelujah. Grace is not the reason why we relax. No. It is the reason why we work hard. Because what? There's a blessing of God upon that hard work that will generate the results that we need. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9. 1 Corinthians. Hallelujah. Can somebody see this? Can we read together? For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, God's building. Please leave the scripture there so that people can see it and, you know, we can process it. Don't take it away. We are laborers. So God is laboring. You, you are flexing. God is laboring. You want to chill. You want to enjoy. Enjoyment is not bad, though. I'm not an advocate of suffering. But God is a laborer. The Bible says he walked for seven days and he rested. God is a laborer. So if your father is a laborer, who would you resemble by not laboring? Hallelujah. I hope we are seeing this now. Whatever perspective or mindset that we've had prior to now, that grace is, we enjoy the grace of God. We are, grace is an investment, is a trust, is for labor. When you ask for more grace, you're asking for more work. When you say, Lord, give me more grace, you are asking for more work. More grace is more work. For to whom much is given, much is what? Grace has been given. 
So every time you drop and say, hey, great, great. Remember, walk, walk day. Let's walk. Hallelujah. So, so now, why do we have to labor? Why do we have to labor? Matthew 9, 37. We read that earlier. Let's bring it. Matthew 9, 37. Hallelujah. Then said he unto his disciples, let's read together. The harvest, but the laborers are few. Why are the laborers few? That's where we're coming from. You know, I told you we are going from known to the unknown or seemingly unknown. The reason why the laborers are few is because the people who should labor, they are chilling. The people who should labor don't know that there's an investment upon their lives with which they should labor. The people who should labor don't know that there's a call upon them to labor. The people who should labor don't know that God is already in the field laboring and is waiting for them to come and join him so that they can labor together. Tell yourself, I'm a laborer. I labor for God. That is why when children will be better, they are better by labor. We bet life by labor. So if, if we increase in number, it is by labor. To go and preach to somebody, get them filled with the Holy Ghost, follow them up. It is labor, sir. It's not easy. It is labor. So if people will move from a certain number to another number and increase, it is by labor. And so if we will judge ourselves appropriately, we have not labored enough. We need to actually labor. So I will give us examples of people who labored in the scripture. So before I give us the examples, there, there, there are, let me see, one, two, three, four areas that I, that I listed out that are important that we must labor in four areas. One is in prayers. We labor in prayers. Two, we labor in the study of the word. Three, we labor in preaching the gospel evangelism, follow-up, enrich. There are people in church today who have not yet grown, who need people to explain things to them. And you are close to them. And you know that they don't understand. That is your ministry. So you, you, you tell them, come to my house. Let's open scriptures together. Let me explain this thing to you. That is labor. And the fourth one is giving. You give yourself first and then you give your substance. Four areas where we need to labor. Colossians 4 verse 12. Let's see an example of labor. Colossians 4 verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you always, saluted you always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Give me another version. Epaphras, who is one of yourselves, a servant of Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. He is always striving for you earnestly in prayers. Can you give me another version? Labor, striving. Epaphras, who is one of you, says hello. What a trooper he has been. He has been tireless in his prayers for you. Can we see labor? Paul was writing about one of the people with him. How he labors for them. For somebody to stand perfect in the faith is by the labor of prayers. And that is why you see that people come to church. They say they are saved. And after a while, you don't see them again. It takes labor to make their feet rooted. A lot of prayers. Hallelujah. So we see an example. We see Paul saying, pray without ceasing. Do you know what without ceasing means? No stopping. It shows you how the, the volume of prayer that needs to go on. Pray without ceasing. Jesus said men ought always to pray and not faint. There's an intensity of prayer. There's a fervency. There's a consistency of prayer that is needed to birth what we want to see God do in our midst. Hallelujah. And so when you see laborers, they are sweaty. Their hands are dirty. They are tired, but they keep on walking. That's what labor is. So the next time you are praying and you don't feel like a laborer, just think about it. Eh? The Bible says Jesus Christ was praying in, in Gethsemane and he was sweating droplets of blood. Not because of what he had done, because of you and I. It shows the, in, it's, and I, 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 I mean, the doctors here can confirm that that there is a medical, I read that there is a medical procedure where your sweat can be like droplets of blood. But it just goes to show you the intensity. Some of us have never prayed half of that level of intensity before. 
we're very casual, very cool. You know, everything is fine. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We bless your name, God. You're so good. But there's an intensity of prayer that is needed. Hallelujah. So in your corner, when you lock the door, and, and, and there's something that I would like to bring to our notice. God loves it when we pray. A man of God that I heard one time said something. He says, when we make prayer about prayer points, we miss the point of prayer. It's not about what, it's not about the prayer point. It's what the prayer does to you. It is what the prayer does to you. So every time that we stay in our room and we are praying, we're not praying for problems. We are just there basking in the glory of God. And that's why it's good to, to pray in tongues. You are just there. It's like when Moses climbed up to the mountain and he, and he was with God. When he came down, his face was bright. Why? He had interacted with glory. So you are just there in your room. You are just praying. It's not for your problem. You are just there. What you are doing is you are offering up incense to God. Our prayers are a sweet smelling incense to God. And so we need to start to think as priests. In the Old Testament, the priests would always offer incense in the temple. And so we need to start to see prayer as a responsibility. Incense that must go up every time. Every time. It's not when you have problems that you must come and pray. The Bible says that the best of the air, they don't labor. God knows their needs and he will meet them. So when we have made prayer the, the tool for getting from God, then we are babies. God wants to be intimate with you. He wants fellowship. Prayer is for fellowship. So when we step in into prayer, don't be in a hurry to say, then this one, you have not, just stay there and just shut back. Just stay there. You might not have any prayer points, but trust me, God is dealing with your situations. When you start to pray for somebody in Japan, you don't know. He's using you to labor for somebody in Utako, you don't know. He's praying through you. So we must take up the labor of prayers. Hallelujah. The next one, because of time, is the word of God. Paul told him what he said, study hard. Say hard. Hard. As believers, I always say something. In the Bible days, there was no Bible school. Then, there was no Bible school. How did men become scholars in scriptures? In cold, in pain, in suffering. They studied hard. And I can tell you, Bible study is not easy. It's not something that you do casually with your leg crossed like this and flip like, no. People labor in study. Before any of the men of God come here to, 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 to share with you, they won't sleep overnight. If you don't know, let me, let me let you, they won't sleep overnight. They are thinking about it through the week. It is labor. And Paul told Timothy, he said, this thing that I teach you, commit to faithful men who are able to teach. So ask yourself here, are you a faithful man that is able to teach what you have been taught on Sunday in your cell group? Are you faithful? If we ask you to explain the mystery of godliness, can you explain it? After 10 years in the faith, can you explain the mystery of godliness? Can you explain laying on of hands? Can you explain why tongues? Can you explain about the infilling of the Holy Ghost? Sir, it is your responsibility. Somebody outside will not explain it. It is you that should explain it. And so what God wants is people who have studied hard, laborers, who in their own right, they can be pastors where they are. So they don't need a pulpit. In the office, they know them already. If somebody is twisting scripture, you can say, come, let me educate you. The Bible talks about Aquila and Priscilla. How they took Apollo in when, he, when he, they saw that he had zeal, but he was mi mixing some things up. They took him in and they taught him. So God's expectation of you is more than your job. Your job is not your purpose. Let me blow your mind. Even children are not your purpose. Because your children, they will determine their own destiny in God. Many people, our children don't even come with us to church. They don't, they don't even believe what we believe. And it speaks to discipleship. It speaks to discipleship. Being able to labor. See, your children become brothers with you in the faith when they receive Jesus truly. Because on that day, when we get to heaven, there's no marriage. There's no daddy and mommy. Every... It might sound hard, but it's the truth. Everybody will stand. So if you, if you tell a child about Jesus, and the child does not receive Jesus, and the trumpet sounds, sir, you know what? I don't have to say. You know what is going to happen. And so we need to labor that these people come into the faith. So the same way that applies to our children, it also applies to people around us, our neighbors, our friends, strangers on the street. God is expecting us to labor. 
He says, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Will you arise to responsibility today? This is January to September. We should ask ourselves, how many people have come to Jesus Christ through me? It's a hard question for everybody. Very, very hard. But it's the truth that must be spoken to myself, to you. How many people have come to know Jesus through you? Remember I spoke earlier that grace is an investment. As you are, you can lay hands on people and they'll be filled with the Holy Ghost instantly. It's in you, but you have never used it before. The Bible says that this sign shall follow them that believe that in my name, they will heal all manner of sicknesses. They will cast out demons. If a demon shows up around you, what will you do? Most likely some people will run. Yes, they will run. But there's an investment upon your life to do these things. These things are not meant for people high up there or, you know, the clergy. It is for us as believers. This is how we take over territories for God. So many of us, we have traded the territories allotted to us in destiny with our physical hustle. There is a territory that God has allocated to you in destiny that you must cover. There is a quota of souls. There's, there's a popular hymn that I remember from, from way back. Must I go and empty handed? Must I meet my Savior so? Not one soul with which to meet him must I empty handed go. Sir, I submit to you this morning. This needs to be in our consciousness. For God to say that the harvest is plenteous but the laborers are few. It means this breaks the heart of God. It is heart breaking. Do you know what happens when there's harvest and there are no laborers? Beds will destroy it. It will spoil. This is God's priority. So I'm speaking to somebody here today. I know you have a job. I know you have a 9 to 5. I know you are trying to make ends meet. But fight for the faith. Fight for the faith. If you don't fight it, an allergy will not fight it for you. If you don't fight it, an ASMO will not fight it for you. It is your responsibility to fight for the faith. And we need to start thinking in terms of covering ground. It's not just by mouth. There's work to be done. It means that as an usher, you need to be very versed in the word of God. So that when you come near the man of God, you are emitting some charges in the spirit realm. And as he's standing and he's speaking, his ministry is just, he's just swearing. As you are standing behind him, you carry your own anointing too. He can say, you know what, go and meet my driver. Let him pray for you. And he can lay hands on you and you will see the power of God. That is what God wants us to be. The Bible speaks of Philip. Philip was a, was a floor member. The Bible says he went to Samaria and he turned Samaria upside down. Only one man. Only one man. Sir, Christianity is a life of power. There's an investment upon your life. You are not too small to be used by God. Timothy was a bishop at 18. You are not too small to be used by God. When you stand before that judgment room, what will you say? I commissioned five projects. I executed 30 contracts. I have four houses. I have a Bugatti. What will you say? Will it count? Is your life counting for the gospel right now? Faithfulness. Effectiveness. Church, God is calling us to effectiveness. It's good to be faithful, to come around every Sunday. It's good. But much more than that, we need to be effective. We need to be like a sword that cuts through territories. The Bible says that with my God, I can scale a wall. We need to scale walls. We need to take the battle to the gate of the enemy. We need to be jealous for God. This is my father's field. He must grow. We must grow it. We must, we must recruit more people. Do you know how viruses work? A virus gets into a system and then it corrupts everything and you know, it changes it to it, the pattern of itself. That's how we should be. You are in a system, you are effective. You infect the system with the Jesus in you. You, inf you, you. you go like a soldier on stealth mode. You go through enemy lines. You infect them. And before you know what, you win them over. You win them over. That is what God is calling us to do. So it is not enough to be fine on Sunday, sir. It's not enough to look good on Sunday. What are you doing for God? Jesus said the, 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 the brand that does not produce, he will cut off. But the one that produces, he will, he will enable to produce more. So there's an investment upon your life. There's an investment upon your life. God has given you grace. See, if you are sick, there's a coin upon your life. Your back is paining you, there's a, there's a coin upon your life. If you are rich, there's a coin upon your life. 
you don't have so much money, there's still a calling upon your life. Everybody here has a calling. Everybody here. You have a calling upon your life. Please don't trade the territories that God has allocated to you in destiny on the altar of work. Personally, I understand how hard it can be. Going to work, coming back tired. But sir, labor needs to be done. It does not matter. Labor must still be carried out. The incense of prayer must still be burnt. It must still be offered. We must study the word of God. Because without the word of God, we have nothing. We are nothing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is somebody been blessed this morning? So, the last two, as I just, I just breeze through it. We talked about prayer. We talked about the word of God. When we study, we can preach. We should be eager to preach. The Bible says that we should be fervent in season and out of season. We should preach. Let me find the scripture for you. Second uh, um, Timothy 4 verse 2. Second Timothy 4 verse 2. And this is for everybody. Can we read together? The instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exalt, with all long-suffering and doctrine. What does he say? What does he say? Did he put anybody's name there? He's talking to you. When last did you preach the word? When last did you sit somewhere and you preach the word of God? Please put the scripture there. When last did you preach the word? He says be instant. In season and out of season. It means when it's convenient and when it's not convenient. Because trust me, it will not always be convenient. Grace. Sir, you have the grace to preach. Don't let anybody lie to you. At the back, you have the grace to preach. At the gallery, you have the grace to preach. Solomon, you have the grace to preach. In the media team, in the media room, all of you there, you have the grace to preach. Music ministers, you have the grace to preach. There's an investment of God upon you and you must make use of it. The last thing is giving. Give bountifully. Give yourself. Romans 12 1 says we should present ourselves in living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. This is a reasonable service. See, reasonable what? Reasonable what? Can we see the point as to, to labor, work? We, we must be careful not to fall into the trap of faithfulness without effectiveness. Where we are used to the motions, we keep coming every day, every day, every day. God is saying, I know your works. I know your works. I know your works. I always say this thing, and I'll say this in closing. We are moved to joy by material things. And if you doubt me, let somebody dash your Range Rover today. Let's see what will happen to you. Or you just get an alert of two billion. Your phone will fall down, most likely. And when they say you shout hallelujah, you're always like this. That time you will jump up. You will start running up and down. You say, I don't know how God do I'm all. I know. That is how we respond. I'm telling you, you don't know how you respond until you see it. But for spiritual things, it doesn't elicit as much joy. The Bible says that there is joy in heaven. For every sinner that repents. So we need to make up your mind that I will be somebody that will be causing uproar in heaven. Back to back to back. Because when you get somebody, you bring him. There's joy in heaven. I find that these days we are more joyous over, you know, parties, housewarming. I got a new promotion. We are very joyful. But when we hear about the blood of Jesus, you hear what next? When we hear Jesus shed his blood... It doesn't move us again. When we hear Christ and us, the hope of glory, we're not excited. I put it to you that you have lost something. May you never lose your wonder. We must always be on the edge every time. Whenever we hear about the truths of the gospel, it must always elicit joy in you. So when you hear somebody speaking and he's talking about the blood that Jesus shed, you are excited about it. Because that is what matters. Everything will end one day. What will remain is the supernatural things that God has done and given to us. Hallelujah. Let us rise up on our feet.